Bonjour à tous ou rebonjour pour ceux qui étaient là ce matin. Nous poursuivons euh, notre euh, journée sur euh, Paris Retail Week. Hein, où, on vous le rappelle, on a un programme de conférence dédié au Augmented Retail. Ce matin, on a parlé de, de différents sujets. On a eu des, des e-commerçants pour nous parler de leur, euh, du développement du Omnicanal. On a également parlé de la, des nouvelles frontières européennes. Google nous a aussi expliqué comment on pouvait faire des gains de productivité avec ces outils. Et on poursuit euh, cet après-midi avec un, un keynote fort passionnant de Philippe Rosenzweig de Kate Spade. Hello Philippe. Il va nous parler dans quelques instants en anglais. Donc j'espère que vous êtes équipé de, de casques de traduction pour ceux qui ne, qui ne comprennent pas l'anglais. Et il partagera avec nous les, les meilleures pratiques, les, les best practices de cette marque américaine, Kate Spade, basée à New York, pour toucher de nouveaux consommateurs, les millennials, euh, également faire la, la jonction entre on et offline. Juste avant de laisser la parole à Philippe, on vous rappelle que vous pouvez intervenir sur les réseaux sociaux avec les, les hashtags de EquipeMag et de ECP16 pour e-commerce. Et si vous avez, comme nos e-commerçants, une approche multicanale, utilisez directement le hashtag Paris Retail Week. Philippe, uh, so it's your turn, so you have 45 minutes. Thank you. Thank and, you. And thank you to be here to today. And you, you just arrived from New York, right? I did. Yeah. Okay, so we listen to you. Thank, thank you. you. So I want to encourage everybody, um, if you come toward the front or the first one or two rows in the back, it will, I will encourage you, and I think you'll be very happy if you do. So I highly encourage you to come into the front or the first one or two rows in the back. Um, Alors, Philippe nous invite à vous rapprocher un petit peu. Pour ceux qui sont vraiment au fond de la salle, n'hésitez pas à densifier les, les rangs de devant. And a few more. Installez-vous devant, n'hésitez pas. There we go. Can we start? Yes. Okay. So, hello and good afternoon. Um, Kate Spade, New York, is where I'm happily employed, overseeing our global efforts in real estate, store design, and construction. Today, I'll speak about the unique feature of bricks and mortar retail in the omni distribution world or perhaps, and I will call this out of self-interest, will I have a job in five years? So first, let me say uh, thank you, Arnaud, for inviting me to speak today, and to, to Cecile uh, for introducing us. Very kind of you. And um, I'm very, very happy to be in Paris speaking today. Uh, to today, I'm going to try to accomplish three things. First. We need to create for this conversation a timeline. And we'll begin by reviewing the history of commerce aligned to the invention of civilization and why brands were invented in the first place. After that, we'll discuss the major changes that began in the late 20th century. And it happens to be approximately, not exact, but approximately when I first began working in branded retail. And finally, I'm going to tell you about Kate Spade, New York. And if I'm half lucky, if I'm really lucky, uh, these three topics will have some relevance to each other and they'll form sort of a storyline. So, why? Why the heck do we build stores all over the place? This is my story in six and a half paragraphs. In the beginning, and everybody knows this and probably stored it deep in the archive of their brain, before civilization, people did something called hunting and gathering. 
They lived tribally, and the human population of the world was about somewhere between one and ten million people. We don't know exactly. And when you, and when you divide, we'll call it five million for the purposes of this, I guess. And if you take all the land of the Earth and you divide uh, it equally among every person, that would be 30 kilometers square per person. Now, you can look at me. I am hardly a hunter. But I do think that I could, ha that I could have survived on this. If you notice in this image, there is no transaction of goods between people. A person just left, got food or whatever, and came back. By 400 AD, we traveled by boat. The population of the world was around 60 million people, and the concentration of people was very much along rivers and major bodies of water. And people farmed outside these areas, and they brought their goods to market a couple times a week. And this allowed other people to make handbags and trade them for chickens. Now, we now have two segments in the distribution model. Notice people meet at the market, buy things, and then they carry them home. Fast forward to the beginning of the 19th uh, Fast forward to the beginning of the 19th century. The first step is the agricultural and industrial revolution was that people farmed, the same as always. Then the common goods were brought to a central location and combined with those of other farmers and put in barrels and shipped to stores. Then the store owner or grocer would measure and package the goods for the customer, and then the customer would take them home. That's three segments. And the store owner, who knew the customer by name, added value by representing the qualities, uses, and benefits of the items that were sold. And the population was about a billion people. Now, I am going to make a small commercial interruption. I've been very lucky in my life. I've traveled globally for a significant duration of my career and visited many great cities and many of the great shopping districts of the world. About nine, about eight, nine years ago, I think, I was working on a project in Rome, and I had an hour or two of free time, and I wandered away from the studio and came across Trajan's Market. We've, many of us have seen it. I took some pictures. If you look at this image, you will notice that this market is several stories tall. The market has a series of openings, and they are demarcated by columns. And because the Romans were meticulous record keepers, we know exactly what was sold in each of these stalls. Olive oil, togas, whatever. In any case, a few years later, I came across this mall that reminded me of Trajan's Market. And it occurred to me, nothing has changed in store design in 2,000 years. That's 2,000 years. Basically, no change. If you are a store designer, this is depressing. But there's a happy ending to the story. What I realized, very importantly, is that one thing changed in those 2,000 years, and that was the invention of brands. This is the end of that commercial interruption. Toward the end of the 19th century, two important things happened in this distribution chain. First, the goods were packaged uniquely and individually, and the grocers no longer needed to weigh them. And the distribution became much wider and made a stop in a distribution center. And the grocer just stood at the counter, tallied up the cost, and put all of the items in the bag. You went to the shelf to get them yourself. And the availability of different types of, types of flour or butter, or the many things we hardly knew we needed, we instantly desired. They grew exponentially. If you look at these packages of butter, which are approximately the same, you can see that each is a little advertisement of its own, balancing some subjective and some objective information. And I, as I was looking at these, I realized that apparently gold foil 
is the agreed upon best well way to sell superior butter. And so the packages replace the grocers in reinforcing the virtues of the products. And one of the reasons that we desired them is that we lived much closer together because there were now two billion people living on Earth. Now, I want to mention, and it's not lost on me, that this distribution type is highly skewed because the world did not evenly adopt this method. Some areas remained, and actually still remain, in the early 19th century model, although the process of globalization juxtaposed those items that can remain in the peer industrial and the post-industrial model. It is easy to imagine an older model of selling food or clothes in a market. In fact, when I travel, I'm sure as you travel, um, you love to see these markets. However, it is much harder to imagine a pre-industrial model for selling and supporting cell phones, say, or something like that. Who knows, but I can't quite imagine it, especially the service. Now, trusting me for one moment, because we could discuss this for a long time, Brands imbue commodities with added value. That's what they do. They direct and they filter decisions, and they offer assurance and authority. In fact, participating in this process is probably what most people in this room do today. I probably don't have to sell you on that idea. But anyway, between 1959 and 1999, the population of the world doubled from three to six million. Flash forward to the 20th century and the explosion of stores and malls and brands that began to distribute globally was exponential also. Today in the United States, there is 2.2 square meters of shopping center for every man, woman, and child. This far outweighs Europe's development. Additionally, there have been huge changes in manufacturing that we're all aware of in China. So, in the current model, for many companies, products are made in one country. They're shipped en masse by type to a distribution center in another country. In that warehouse, they are unpacked and repacked with multiple types into cartons and taken home by consumers. This remains four segments. And by the way, the population today is about 7.5 billion people. Now, what I have failed to show in most of my overly simplistic distribution charts, is, and it's very important, is that the trip from the store to the home is unique amongst all the, sub, uh, amongst all the segments. This is because it's not one segment at all. It's not one segment. It is millions and millions of individual trips, and they are shopping trips and they're performed by people known as customers. Each little trip transfers product from stores to home. We do this daily, weekly, monthly, depending on the product, the need for freshness, etc. And this trip is part of our experience of life. It is a part of our multiple cultures. In the process of going out and collecting goods, we also meet people, and sometimes we avoid people. We see new products, we see people using products, we eat, we get exercise, we check the weather, check the weather, um, understand if our institutions are working, and we interact with society at large. One of the things we especially do is watch other people because most of us are quite social. We have been doing this for about 12,000 years. 12,000 years. And this essentially is called civilization. So thank you for indulging me in this little history lesson. And now I want to introduce you and share with you a new idea. It's called the internet. You may have heard of it. It was, a pre it was invented approximately in 1990 along with the web browser. And when adopted to commercial use, it was a major disruptor. It, a disruptor of the type that I kind of suspect many people in this room don't appreciate because many people in this room, like almost my entire team at, at where I work, 
never experienced life before the internet. So I think it's, it's important to understand what that disruption was because it, it informs a fundamental question of how we approach um, the relationship between e-commerce and bricks and mortar. The new proposition basically is you browse for items at home on the internet, you purchase them, and then you receive them all at home. The proposition is enticing in that you have a portal to, um, you, have a, you actually have a portal to everything. Everything that's out there, most everything that's out there, you can find. And I want to note, and because this is a conversation about commerce, that the web is useful for a jillion other things besides buying stuff. But I'm going to focus on two things, the commercial aspect of the web and the ability to spread information, which I'm going to call a story. By the time the internet was seriously used by the general public, it was 1993, when the first home use, use browser that was called the Mosaic One was released. And coincidentally, that is the year that Kate Spade became a brand. So Kate Spade, the brand that I work for, has grown up entirely in the internet age. And, and I don't want to be ridiculous, but the internet has grown up entirely in the Kate Spade age. The one question is, under what circumstances people are willing to trade off this experience of selecting an item in a market and carrying them home, which, as I noted, has a 12,000-year history, with alternately buying on the web. Now, I am a pro proponent of buying on the web. After all, buying items online, receiving them in the, in the mail, avoiding traffic and parking, and perhaps navigating a stroller with shopping bags through a store, to me, it seems kind of compelling. And as I noted earlier, it could put me out of a job. Oh. Uh, hello. Oh. Oh. Amazon, which completed two, 2015 with about $107 billion in sales, transacted in about 10 countries, almost exclusively online, is still struggling after 21 years to figure this out this notion of bringing things home and making it economical. If you think about it, their proposition is to have you peruse almost endless number of products and have them shipped to you at your home. But, depending on how you fill your cart versus purchasing each item one at a time, and depending on how they organize and optimize the warehouses, it may or may not be profitable. They're working very hard on that proposition. And because customers, that's me particularly, have been extremely resistant to pay for the hard cost of shipping, Amazon has resorted to offering free shipping in exchange for a flat yearly membership fee, Amazon Prime, for those of you who don't use it. I think this does create some loyalty, but the question is at what cost? And ironically, the very platform, the internet, that brings us consumer access to all of these products also, in, also allow us to instantly search for the lowest price. Oh. Oh, we're back. How many people have used Honey for Chrome? Does anybody use that? Honey for Chrome? Yes? It, it searches the, wor the entire web for every coupon that's available. Um, anyway, you should check it out. Anyway, the internet has the effect of turning virtually everything that is commonly distributed to a commodity. This is probably not a revelation to anybody in this room, or perhaps anybody who shops in the world. And I think we have a little... Oh, there we go. Sorry. Without my ever asking, and it should be noted that I'm not a sophisticated enough to figure this out, my browser is endlessly looking for and providing the best price to me for everything, from theater tickets to books 
to light bulbs. It probably considers me foolish when I ignore its advice. But clearly, we humans are hardly hardwired for comparative shopping. So prior to telling you about Kate Spade New York and some of the unique ways that we approach our business, I want to share with you one more image, and it's extremely telling. I divide the world in, of retail into three large categories, and they seem to more or less conveniently live along an asymptotic curve of margin. You, if you go to the right, you add value. If you go up, you add cost. To begin with, the relationship is a sort of a straight line, and then it begins to curve up. Margin is pretty important as an indicator for me because it tells me how much excess money I have to do whatever I think is best to grow my business. We're going to start by discussing luxury and designer brands. From a commercial point of view, when looking at the relationship between cost and value, a luxury good is one in which the cost approaches a point of having no relationship to value. So you can see on the chart that the cost is approaching infinity, it's going up, and it's not adding much more value. This reaps huge margin that can be used for all sorts of things, like personal shopping services, runway shows, finding couture lines, funding them, and a lot of other great things that we, at least I, enjoy vicariously, even if we do not directly participate in them all the time. Designer brands, Armani, Chanel, etc., are a special category of luxury goods because they trade on the value that's added because of the designer's participation in the process. But all luxury brands walk a very fine line between being available and maintaining exclusivity. And within the frenzy of entry into the, into the trading and online and e-commerce, their approach is extremely cautious. And if you want to do a little test, try buying a brand new Birkin bag online. It's a pretty hard thing to find. At the other end of the spectrum are stores, both bricks and mortar, and e-commerce stores that are conveying either actual commodities or ubiquitous brands, or perhaps we should say labeled products. Clearly, they trade at a place where the cost to value is very important. And that relationship for the branded items that are sold are easily tracked online. As I showed you earlier, when I go light bulbs on Google, it immediately shows me pricing. There are lots of permutations of the various brands. Some of them add a bit more value and consequently enjoyed a bit more margin. But essentially, their products are nearly identical. In between the luxury stores and the commodity stores reside the light luxury or aspirational brands. And this, at long last, is what we've arrived at the part of the business that Kate Spade occupies and our competitors occupy in this unique area of the business. You can see that in our area of the cost to value line that we are beginning to cost a little bit more and we're giving up a little bit of value and that creates a little bit of margin. So we have a bit more margin to do the things with, that we want to do with our brand that others can't do. And the question is, what do we do with this opportunity and how do we express it? And should we focus our efforts on building stores, which are expensive, brand enhancing but expensive, or enhancing and refreshing our landing page, creating state-of-the-art delivery of our products, or maybe some combination of both. And I think it comes back to brands. The clearer the initial vision of the brand, the easier it is to filter choices that guide the brand as it's growing, 
and retelling its unique and compelling story. We at Kate Spade and Company have a unique and compelling story. Nobody else can tell, tell it because nobody else has that story. And we express it in our voice. And that is the key to why brands exist. But it doesn't necessarily inform where we invest or which channels of distribution should we use or what, how much general advertising or marketing or logistics. That question is really important if you consider the pro proliferation of really high quality opportunity offered by websites like Pinterest or House that have incubated huge followings, tastemakers and the followers without any initial commercial investment and slowly they've allowed them to transact on their websites. So I'm going to give you a short story of our brand and then tell you a bit about how we are uh, addressing this question. Uh, this, this is a pretty big room. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about product. And how many people know Kate Spade? Let me ask you. Show of hands, Kate Spade. Now I'm going to ask a really terrifying question. How many people own a piece of Kate Spade? Is there anybody? Wow. Thank you for owning a piece of Kate Spade. I'm much ingratiated to you, and I see my work is cut out for me. Um, I am going to show you a few pieces of product, and then I'm going to show them up there also. Um, uh, just so you get an idea of the variety of items that we have. Uh, we have this bag. Let me see if I can find that up there. Ah, lucky. It has that strap right in here. That strap is still wrapped nicely, but it has that nice strap. It is a approximately, you know, it's kind of got a little bit of a nice line, just squared up. It's had a lot of read rate lately. It's it's a current product on the shelves today, so it's kind of nice to look. Yeah. All right. Then we have. Uh, oh, you know what they did? When I went to the store, they didn't realize I was bringing them to a speaking engagement, and they started wrapping them. And so this is what it looks like wrapped. Um, uh, uh, our packaging is a big part of our, uh, our product and our presentation, and it makes a great gift. So I'm going to unwrap it. You notice lots of color. And that is, let's see if I can get that one up. Ah, there. So the first one was a basic bag. This one has a bit of embellishment, still a basic bag. Has these nice things. I think they're quite fashionable. Has these little stones. And this has been selling like crazy, little magnetic catch, so on and so forth. Is anyone familiar with this bag? Apparently it's sold out. I don't know. It, I, I was told it sold out, and um, it's. P and then the third one that I'm going to show you, we do quite a bit of tr of business in novelty. It's a unique part of our business. It is this one. The cat bag. There you have it. So these three bags, it kind of gives you an idea of what we look like. Kate Spade brand, traded under the name Kate Spade New York, was invented or perhaps dreamed up in 1993 by a talented designer, editor named Kate Brosnahan, who was married to the well-known designer and brand expert Andy Spade. He has a company today called Partners and Spade. The brand name is the combination of their two names, Kate and Spade. In fact, initially, the brand remained quite small, although quickly became known and admired until it was sold um, by the couple to Neiman Marcus, large luxury uh, retailer um, uh, department store, and subsequently it was acquired by Liz Claiborne, a holder of multiple brands. In 2014, 
The last of the multiple brands was sold off, and the former subsidiary, Kate Spade, became the na namesake brand. So we are now traded on the New York Stock Exchange under the name, under the Kate Spade brand. Initially, the brand was based upon designing and manufacturing very simple, square-ish handbags. That is the original number one bag for Kate Spade. As a refresher, I want to show you our present bags filled with embellishment, etc., because I want you to see that they are actually, they have not strayed so far. When I first encountered the brand in the late 90s, it was in search of purchasing the perfect maternity gift for an employee of mine. She was an accomplished executive, and I was taken by the simple and obvious proposition a baby bag for the mother instead of the baby. It turns out that the mom, and sometimes the dad, carries the baby bag, and the baby is somewhat oblivious to the purchase. Until then, baby bags were cartoonish and looked like something the baby might enjoy. Retrospectively, that seems pretty obvious, but at the time, it was genius. And that, I guess, is the nature of inventions. During the first 15 years of its existence, the company embarked on expanding into Japan and a few other global locations, but otherwise traded substantially in North America. It added a very limited ancillary product group, and the distribution was sm small. If you fast forward to 2008, the brand embarked under the current leadership, headed by CEO Craig Levitt, to a strategic change that has led to a growth of more than 10 times its revenue in those nine years. How did this happen? It's a good question. As I showed you, photograph, as I show you photographs, I'll identify some of the core practices that we adhere to and that resonate with our clients or that we've allowed us to grow. I guess it's that simple. And it will begin to illuminate how we navigate the question between webs and store. Five of the many critical things that we think about in regard to stores and our brand that you might want to look for are these. Authenticity, authenticity and products true to our story, engaging the senses, voice of the brand in context to the consumer, meeting our customers where they are, and diversity of products, channels, and price points. These are all important things that we look at. Not at all everything that we look at, but many things that we look at. Our company is built on four pillars that are the basis for a truly lifestyle positioning for the brand. We trade in women's, men's, children's, and home products. Within our women's pillar, for which we are best known to date, our categories include handbags, small other goods, eyewear, footwear, apparel, outerwear, loungewear, a lot of them, watches, fragrance. In, in 2013, we launched a Madison Avenue collection that encapsulates the finest fabrications and builds on the core of the collection. In the meantime, we added athleisure and the children's collection that I mentioned, is, which, is dis, which is distributed in the US and it's in select locations. It's also mostly distributed in Japan. And in 2016, we added a com casual component known as Broom Street, named after the location of the oldest store. Our men's line trades presently in wholesale, although it's being developed in retail, and in e-commerce, of course. But the largest addition to our family has been 2015 introduction of home products. Kate Spade has traditionally traded in crystal, stationery, and china, including the number one bridal pattern in the United States. The recent additions have made Kate Spade a unique player among fashion brands. Among our competitors, say Tory Burch, Michael Kors, none of those brands are trading in the same groups. While we have a wholesale showroom for each of the brand categories, we recently had the opportunity to develop a little pop-up that ran for four months, and I want to show you a few pictures of it in New York. You'll see the breadth of the home collection. You'll see furniture, 
you will see art, you will see tabletop, that is our own lighting line, our own rugs, uh, stationary, bedding, kitchen. It's quite comprehensive, actually. There's a little bit of our home collection. Our diversity of product offering and pricing is democratic, but we are not all things to all people. All decisions are filtered within the guardrails of the brand, and this diversity allows us to follow growth trends on our own terms. We do not chase everybody else's trend. I want to start out by saying that while we are a lifestyle brand embracing all pillars of the, bra of the brand, we have a uniquely feminine voice. A core of our brand voice trades on the idea of living an interesting life. We have a literary basis for our, vo our, for our voice and it infiltrates our products. In fact, our company is made up of almost 90% women, including our chief creative officer, Deborah Lloyd. The company's distribution includes more than 30 countries. I actually heard today that it was 39 countries, with our most recent being India. And presently, our largest distribution outside of North America is in Asia, while the fastest growth is in Europe. We operate in multiple relationships according to the geographical location, and we trade in retail, wholesale, outlet, e-commerce, and travel retail locations. And we're extremely invested in understanding each location and opportunity globally. All the decisions for locations are made in New York. We think of global distribution as both an opportunity to reach out to our customer where they are, as well as being a hedge against the perturbations of local markets. The diversity of products, price points, distribution model, and points of distribution allows us to meet clients in many times and places of her life. We like to say she embodies the essence of New York City, but all the world is her stage. So the question is, what do our stores look like and what do our shops look like? Our stores are rooted in the mid-century modernism as expressed in New York City within maybe a large New York City apartment. All of our stores tied to the New York experience to, to women wherever they are. One of my favorite images she has brought New York to, I have no idea where that is. Our voice is authentic. We have a large number of architectural parts that can be assembled together in various configurations with the goal of creating brand identifiable shops and yet each one having a unique feature. We aspire to make our stores look different. A recent example. This is Regent Street in London where there was a restriction that we couldn't use our facade at all. So, an icon of the brand is our Sputnik lamps that you see at the top. We usually put three, four, or five of them prominently in the store, but we put 30 in the upper register, and what happened was people understood it was Kate Spade, even though we didn't really have any Kate Spade on the outside of the store. When you enter the store, you see a strong presentation of handbags, small leather goods, and sort of the welcoming neon on the right that is offered in many languages, including a Cheerio for London. We try to speak the local language and the local culture. As you progress through the store, you see the juxtaposition of our core products against our monthly deliveries. The back of the store has this shoe salon, and it also, we decided to put it behind the stairs so that you would understand that you could go upstairs to find other things. The shoe salon has been extremely successful, and one of the reasons, I think, is that it balances a sense of being hidden. You can see the shoes, but it's also a little bit hidden, a little less exposed. Upstairs, uh, a bit of our children's area, and some of, again, the local culture. It says she lets her, e her emails pile up, but never forgets to call, crossed out, ring her grandmother for a chat, crossed out, chinwag, speaking local vernacular. 
We made a small gesture to the British China room, but at the, begin the back of the store on the upper level, we created a little terrace. This terrace has our most casual outside, uh, our most casual dinnerware as well as cookware, but it also looks like the penthouse view looking back out to New York. We always go back to the reference of New York. This is our store in Fashion Walk in Ca Causeway Bay, Hong Kong. One of our motifs is this um, bow screen. In this case, we took the bow screen and we, made, we illuminated it. We did a special art video on the left side. We wanted to be part of the local culture. We wanted to feel like we were part of Causeway Bay. And this is our store in Japan. Again, the bow motif, but expressed quite differently so that you can feel that being part of where we are is as important as bringing New York to the place that we are. And this is a recent addition in South Coast Plaza, which is Southern California. This is probably the largest presentation of luxury goods in Southern California. This mall carries all major brands. We took four years to develop this store. When you enter it, you can see some commonalities of the motif. Notice that the floor is this stone floor. It's a very hard room, very bright. If you look carefully on the left side, you'll see some of the local, uh, some, some of the seasonal um, product, particularly that month was bees when we opened. And it's mixed with the core of the brand product. The second room becomes a wood floor. It's a, it's a less commercial but still prong, strong presentation of small leather goods. In the third room, we introduce our furniture on carpet, and you can see a bit of the children's wear beyond. Um, the next room is a home presentation. And the next room is shoes. Notice there's carpet on wood. And finally, our presentation of Madison Collection, which is all in a wall-to-wall -wall carpet. It's softer, more ornate. It's a better, higher level presentation. What I want to call out is that we take our stores not literally, but philosophically as a residential presentation. We go from hard to soft, open to intimate, louder to quieter. It's a part of our strategy. Finally, these two pieces of artwork, we wanted to create artwork that would be aligned to the Southern California sensibility, so we commissioned five or six of these. These two sat next to one of the fitting rooms. And this is uh, our Herald Square shop and shop. It's a corner. Although it's entirely different from any store, it still expresses the same as Kate Spade, color, product, etc. And finally, we just opened in Galleries Lafayette with a temporary space on the first floor. In fact, you can see the product that I was showing you in this, in this photograph. And what I like about this is, although it is tiny, it is as big as this podium to this side, it still conveys the color of the brand and the sense of the brand. We speak the language of the brand. When she goes into the fitting room, she can pull down this shade and create a selfie to ask her friend if this is the right bag or the right dress. And of course, it's on the new, the behind her, wherever she is, she's looking at New York City. This guy is a, at the smallest scale. We sometimes put in this little mouse and mouse hole with the welcome. She's quick and curious and playful and strong. The brand is set in with the product. We never abandon the brand. We always keep it along with the product. We speak to a literary background and what at that time we were creating clutches that were uh, made to look like novels. And this was a great project that uh, just went out to all of our stores. 
This is called size things up or pack a bag. One of the things that we found out is that many women do not want to take their items out of their bag and put it into a fresh bag, even though they want to know if it's going to fit everything they had. So we created a series of factices, nail polish, lipstick, computers, and of course a bottle of champagne, because everybody needs a bottle of champagne. And we, and people br brought them in and they would try them on and put them into their bag and it did two things. First of all, it satisfied their curiosity. Am I going to be able to put my laptop into my bag? And secondly, it allowed us to start a conversation on what that bag is going to be used for. Our digital storefront is strong and aligned to the brand, in fact, a leader of the brand. And notice, find it and shop near you. You can go on and see if you can just go to the store and pick it up yourself. We market in all of the typical ways that people market, print media, out of home, digital, social media, direct mail, digital ma magazine, and video. And notice the, the ways that that reads across the images. We relentlessly follow, uh, follow social media and, follow, and we find that people follow us. We have, at the end of 2015, 2.5 million Facebook followers. We have a good celebrity following. We find that celebrities pick us because we're right for them. And of course, who doesn't like editorial coverage? So, Omni-channel distribution changed everything. Let's review. I told you in this talk about the history of shopping and the major disruption that began 23 years ago. Then I told you that our section of the business enjoys a unique place in the margin curve. And finally, I told you about our brand and how it emerged from its infancy. I asked you to look within the images for the brand voice, the authenticity, and the congruence of all the ways that the brand expresses itself. And of course, I asked at the beginning if the stores, which are very expensive to build and operate, have a place in our future. So the question is, how do these tie together? Everybody's talking about omnichannel, which is simply a logical response to the, afford the opportunity afforded by the high-speed, high-res graphic, low-cost communication world that we live in. When she says that she wants it, she wants it where she wants it and when she wants it. I think that she has a little idea or interest. I don't even think she cares how we solve that. When I speak to our customers, especially the ones who came of age in the past 10 to 15 years, they tell me the same thing. Find it online, visit it in a store, that's good news, I get to keep my job, and buy it wherever and whenever she wants while continually communicating with her friends about the decision. In order to do this, we need to have strong voice. Our brand needs to always feel strong. We need to reinforce our brand Wherever she is, where, in New York, using color, using literature, voice of the brand. In fact, if you think about it, she didn't fall in love with us. We didn't get engaged because she liked the way that we delivered the product. She loved the product and she loved what we said. And so we continue to do that, a little bit of humor, and our cast of characters. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Philip. Uh, I think we have time for a few Q and A questions for short Q and A sessions. So, okay. Si vous avez des questions, levez les mains. Je vois une main qui se lève au fond. On va en prendre deux ou trois. Alors, levez-vous et présentez-vous rapidement à l'audience pour poser votre question.
Uh, Charles Crouch with Chisholm Institute. You said that Kate Spade started out very simply with handbags of a very clean design. Now you've extended it to a lot of different product lines. What have been some of the challenges of extending your brand out so far? Well, there, there are a lot of challenges. One thing is we don't own expertise in all of, the, in all of these products. So we need to make sure that when we license a product, that we license it with somebody at our level or higher in t and have tremendous expertise in, in creating the, the products that are going out and that they can deliver with the same level of delivery that we expect from ourselves. So that's one. And another one is that as you grow the brand exponentially, how much can fit into a store and how do you get access to the products? What's the best way to deliver the products? Thank you. Est-ce qu'il y a une autre question dans la salle, en français ou en anglais Profitez-en. Si vous travaillez dans l'industrie du luxe, peut-être, ou sur la construction d'une marque. Pas de question Yeah. I want to say, can I say one other thing What's yeah, another question yeah. Another question No um, no. If you, does anybody, can you feel under your chair Take your hand and put it under your chair. Regardez sous vos chaises, je crois qu'il y a une petite surprise. Does anyone feel anything under the chair whatsoever? Right at the lip, right at the front. Anyone coming up with anything? Yeah? No. Yes? Anyone? Quel Quelqu'un a trouvé quelque chose sous sa chaise? At the chair next to you. Anyone feel right at the front of the chair? Anyone feel anything? Yes? No? No. No? Nobody feels anything under any chair. There is nothing. Je crois no. est. There is something. What does it say? Does it have a number? Ah, attendez, je, je, je vous rejoins. Il y avait what, une surprise sous une des chaises. Mademoiselle l'a trouvé. Dites-nous ce que vous avez trouvé en anglais, si vous pouvez. Une carte de Kate Spade and Company. So, what is it exactly? Avec la carte de visite de Monsieur. And on the back side. So, Hash three. Hash three. Hash three. Oh. Hash three. Je crois que c'est un cadeau. Ah, this is the third bag. This belongs to wow, you. Wow, bravo. <laughs> Please find those other bags, otherwise I have to convince United Airlines oui, why I'm bringing them back. Continue to check sous les chaises. Il y a sans doute une ou deux autres cartes. Mademoiselle. <laughs> C'est Noël avant l'heure. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other bags? Do you like a cat bag? A chat? Superbe, ce, ce sac. C'est un petit chat, c'est ça? Yes? No? I know there's another of them. There are two of them out there. Est-ce que quelqu'un a trouvé une autre carte? <laughs> a one or a two, please. Dépêchez-vous. They're somewhere out there. I think they're ah, in the front. Ah, mademoiselle en a trouvé une autre. Bravo, mademoiselle. Quel numéro avez-vous? Thank you very much for your business card. I'm very happy to have it. Number one. Number one. Hash one. Ah. Allez-y, je vous en prie. Allez retirer mm. votre Please come here. votre sac. A priori, il en, il en reste encore une. Il reste encore une carte quelque part. Est-ce que quelqu'un a trouvé strap. la dernière oh, carte? There you go. Thank you. Thank you. And, and anyone for number two? No? No. All right. Pas d'autres cartes. Bon, peut-être euh, encore quelques instants de recherche. No. So maybe one last question. Uh, sure. So Kate Spade uh, has, a, has a corner at the Galerie Lafayette in Paris. Do it you, does. Do you plan to open your own hmm. shops? It's the, it's the big question. As you know, very difficult to find a space. We haven't found a space yet. We've looked and we've looked. So we want to, we would love to, we think it's the perfect idea, but I have no news yet. And the website is not in French yet. Pardon? The website is not in French. The website presently is in English. We're growing the website at, la at large right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if people in France want uh, a Kate Spade bag, they can Purchase it but online? But it is, it is in Europe now. Okay. No, 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 it right. is in Europe. It is in Europe. It is, you can go online and purchase, absolutely. Okay. Yes. 
La troisième carte, elle reste... Euh... Ah, c'est vous qui l'avez trouvée Non, une question. I have one question because I've seen that you're using a perch technology for um, those animated digital tables um, in, I, I think it's in the New York boutique. Yes. Um, do you have any experience how long, if yes, people stand there at animated digital tables instead of just ordinary merchandising exposing more or less the same products? You know, I don't know the exact answer, but I will say we did do this in, in, um, in combination with Perch, and it was a very enjoyable collaboration. We have a long history of testing technologies um, in various ways inside of the stores, outside of the stores, et cetera. It, it is our goal. We think that our customer likes technology just as long as it's on the terms of within the breadth of the brand and within the guardrails of the brand. I'm not sure how long. I did know that it increased um, sales. I do know that. Um, and it was a test in, I think, 10 stores. Yeah. W was it a good question that she deserves the last bag? <laughs> sure. <laughs> it's yours. Très bien. For the question. So, désolé pour la yeah. troisième carte. Yeah. Le, le troisième sac well est, est, est offert. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much, you. Philippe, for your time. So I hope that everybody has the answer they were looking for today. Um, on va rebasculer en français. So thank you. On peut applaudir, Philippe. Thank you. Yep. <laughs>